Thank you for letting me know. Okay, okay. So because it's just you today, what I'm thinking is I'm going to go through our um, cold call and off market training that we have scheduled for today. Um, but then if you want, I want to get you out with Andrew and get you on the floor okay. and start having you make phone calls today. Okay. I know it's a little nerve wracking, <laughs> but, um, that's going to be like your quickest way of just kind of like figuring things out, just jumping in. Okay. Did he go over the, um, the script yesterday with you? Um, kind of, we did a little like back and forth between mm -hmm. me and Angelica, but and then we went like took some stuff out that you know is for out of state and stuff. Yep. So we did some stuff on it. Some of it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we'll do a little script practice today, okay. um, and uh, get you out to the floor and actually have you start doing um, some phone calls okay. and kind of starting to build your database. We'll get you into um, the back end of the app and then also into Monday. So we'll get your Monday system set up, okay. um, so you can kind of start building out. Um, referrals and people that you have in there. Okay. I'm going to go grab a marker really quick. And I'll Where I've got, oh, I get like a thousand <laughs> questions. Okay, let's hope these work. Nope, that one didn't work. Of course. Uh, okay, that works good. All right, so today, cold call. So, cold calling is one of um, one of my favorite things to do, just because it's cheap and easy, and it's very efficient. Um, it can be daunting having to sit there and make a lot of calls. But what's cool about cold calling is um, you have the opportunity to hit um, so many more prospects in such a shorter amount of time. So like an open house, for example, you'll be there for two to four hours and you may get one person in, you may get 10 people in, you just don't know, it's all inbound. Cold calling, I can say, hey, I'm not gonna leave today until I get a lead. And I know that my lead count comes from doing X amount of phone calls. So the way that I track my numbers with cold calling is I do um, calls, contacts, leads, and appointments. And so the difference between all of these is calls is the actual number of outbound calls you made. So like, let's say you do um, 500 calls for the day. So those are 500 actual physical phone numbers that you're putting out for the day. But let's say only 100 of those people answered, those would be contacts. So, and a contact is not somebody who answers the phone and you start talking and they hang up on you. A contact would be an actual 
two-way communication, somebody who's actually engaging in a conversation with you, even if they're like, why are you calling me? Like, I don't want to talk to you. Take me off your list. They're actually engaging in some form of communication, even if it's a no, because what you want to start tracking is how many no's to get to your yes. And so that's going to give you your dial ratio, which we'll talk about in a second. So contacts is actual conversations. Leads is somebody that goes into your CRM. So a lead is somebody who's like, hey, I'm interested in some way, shape or form, whether it's days, weeks, months or years, or it could be, I'm not interested in at all, but I know somebody that may be. So a lead is they've expressed interest and they're giving you information. So usually they'll give you, um, like their email or they'll give you um, data on their home. They'll give you some form of information other than the information that you already have, which would be their phone numbers and potentially their emails. And then appointments is actual appointments. So setting the appointment. And so this would be, hey, I'm going to be coming to your house tomorrow at three o'clock. So it's an actual appointment. Um, phone appointments count too. So if you have like a follow-up phone appointment um, or a follow-up in-person appointment, both of those will count for your appointments. So let's say that um, of your ratios, let's say you call 500 numbers and let's say you talk to 100 people and of those 100 people, let's say you get three leads. And then let's say of those three leads, you get one appointment. So 500 calls, depending on um, if you're manually dialing or auto dialing, it's going to be two different things. So we'll do auto over here and we'll do manual over here. So manual dial of 500 numbers is probably going to take you about five hours. And that's if you're like really cruising through them. The reason I would say 500 or five hours is because you're only getting a hundred people ans answering. So a hundred of your five, so that's about 20 people an hour that you're talking to. And that boils out to about, it would be about half a lead an hour, but I'm just gonna say one lead an hour. And then your appointment is really gonna depend on um, which one of those leads that you're talking to. But that's gonna be your appointment for the day. And then if you're on an auto dialer, you can probably get through 500 numbers in about probably two and a half hours. It's gonna be about half the time. And your 120 uh, people, you're gonna probably talk to probably 40 to 50 an hour. And again, that's gonna depend on <clears throat> how thorough of a conversation they're having with you. Now, what I have found with cold calling when I was doing it back in 2016, I was getting about 20 contact, 20 contacts an hour. And of those 20, I was getting like three to four leads. So I had a little higher of a conversion. Granted, the market back then was a lot different. Um, but all of these numbers are going to have to come off of you tracking them. So, um, and then that would come out to about um, one lead an hour. And then your one appointment for the day. So, it's really going to boil down to, like we talked about yesterday, your tone, um, how you're engaging with people, um, your confidence on the phone. Confidence on the phone comes from competence. So if you are not competent in what you're talking about, you're not going to be very confident, right? I can come up here and say, hey, I'm going to sell this marker. And I know everything about this marker. I know it's from Staples. I know it's blue. I know it's a fine tip. I know it has vibrant colors. I can sell this marker, right? But if I have this marker behind my back and I'm just feeling it and I don't know what this is, I'm not confident in selling this product because I don't know exactly what it is. 
So the more familiar you come with your script and the product of Bellwood and what we do, the more confident you're going to be on the phone. And the only way to do it is just to start talking to more and more people. So that's what's hard is probably your first few days of calling is going to be really uncomfortable. Um, you're going to feel totally like this is just weird. It's not feeling right. That is totally normal. If you are feeling like awesome and great and like ready to tackle the phone, you probably have experience. Um, no one is confident going into making cold calls. It's just not a comfortable, natural thing. But what's really cool about it is once you get kind of those first few days out of the way, it's just a natural flow. And every single day you get on the phone, it's okay, goodbye, next. Okay, goodbye, next. Oh, you're interested? Great. Da -da 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 -da. Let me give me my information. Let me get you an appointment. Okay, goodbye, next. So you'll kind of find your flow of it. So what I would suggest doing is um, every day that you're in here, you're gonna track how many calls you're making, how many contacts are being made, how many leads are coming from that, and how many appointments are coming from that. Now that would be for um, like a traditional set of lists. So that would be calling like off-market people, that would be calling your database, um that would be a straight cold list with bellwood you're going to want to track a little different um because we're focused a little differently you're still going to classify it as kind of like cold calling um, but you definitely still want to track your numbers um and the time of day and locations that you're calling so first thing that you're going to do is um time of day And then you're gonna to wanna to track like your state or your region. So um, if you're calling California homes at 9 a.m., you're probably gonna have a better answer rate than calling the East Coast at 2 p.m., right? Cause they're getting, they're closer to five o'clock at that time. They're winding down, people aren't on the phones as much, not interested in you know negotiating as much. So um, time of day that you're calling, the state or region that you're calling. Now let's say you're calling um, California and Texas, then you're gonna have two sets of lists going. So you're gonna have your time for California leads and your time for Texas leads. And what I would suggest doing is you're calling those same leads in that same time block that you were establishing. So if your California houses are your first group, you're going to want to call all of those for your first 20 or 30 minutes, then call all your Texas ones, just so your tracking is a lot more thorough and a lot more consistent with what time did I call them? And then you're kind of logging like 303, 307, like that can get a little daunting. So if you say, hey, from two o'clock to two thirty, I called California and from two thirty to three, I called Texas. That's going to be a lot better of statistics to kind of run your numbers. So time of day, state and region, then you're going to want to call um, or track your numbers based on the houses that you're prospecting and then the agents that you're prospecting. And the difference between these is when you're calling a house, or sorry, when you're calling to obtain a house, you're trying to put out an LOI or an offer. So these are gonna be LOIs and offers. Whereas agents, this is gonna be relationships. When you build more relationships, that's where you're gonna gain more LOIs and offers. So the way that I kind of tell people um, of how to find agents is to find houses first because the house is there, the house is advertised, it's marketed. Whoever's listing that house, I'm going to go to them to build that relationship. Now, if I can also get an offer with them, that's, you know, two birds, one stone. So let's say there's all of these houses right we have house a b c and let's say this is in um texas 
And let's say the day before I met Joe in Texas. And it doesn't matter how I met Joe, but I met Joe. So I can either keep talking to Joe and say, hey, Joe, I found house A, B, and C. Can you call all those for me? Can you put offers in on all of those for me? He'll say yes. So you're going to come out with three offers, but no new relationships. Whereas you can tell Joe, hey, Joe, I need you to find me three houses today or two houses today that we can put offers on. So Joe's going to bring you his own houses over here. So let's say he brings you two houses. So that would be two LOIs for the day. But then you're going to call the Joe on this house, the Joe on this house, and the Joe on this house and say, hey, Joe, Joe A, Joe B, Joe B, Joe C, I want to put an offer on your house, but I don't have an agent. Can you represent me? So now you just gained an agent relationship and you just gained an LOI. So you have an offer that went out and you have another Joe to add to over here. House B, hey Joe, a different Joe, I want you to represent me. Can you put an offer on house B? And hey, by the way, I'm looking for more of these. So now you just gain another Joe and an LOI. Same for C, I gained another Joe, now an another LOI. So now at the end of the day, I've put out three offers. I've gained three new relationships while maintaining my other Joe over here. And he found house D and E for my other two LOIs. So now I got five LOIs out for the day and I have four relationships. So every day that can compound. So every day you're gonna be how we split up our new generating and our follow-up. So these are, these are our follow-ups. And then this is our new lead gen. So every day you should be finding houses to put offers on and you should be following up with all the Joes that are in your database. Because if you don't keep adding Joes to your database, you're just going to have one or two people and then you're always finding houses which can be exhausting. The name of the game is to get enough Joes over here to where you don't have to find houses anymore. They're bringing you the houses. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yes. So cold calling for Bellwood, we need to know, okay, I called three new houses today and then I followed up with two relationships from the day, two agents from the day. Hey Joe, how's it going? Did you find any houses for me? I've already looked at house A, B, and C. I need new inventory from you. What do you have off market? Do you have anything coming up? So those are the follow-up relationships. These are the new outbound relationships. And then we need to track what time of the day that we're calling these people in these states. Because if we're not adding more Joes to our pipeline, then there's usually a time of day issue or a time blocking issue. And then again, that's where we go back to our data and we say, okay, Osh, you're calling Joe in Texas at uh, 4 p.m. There's a conflict of difference of time, right? So instead of four, let's move back your Texas calls to maybe noon, which means whatever you were doing at noon, we need to now shift in your time block to have that be a different section of your day. Make sense? Yes. Cool. So regular cold calling is going to be different than kind of Bellwood's cold calling. All right. So there's not as easy to erase. All right. So I'm just going to kind of go over. Um, few different types of customers when you're cold calling. This is going to be more traditional and not so much um, of your Bellwood type focus. So different people that you're going to come across on the phone, you're going to come across the factual people. You're going to come across the friend. 
and you're going to come across the objector. The difference between all of these people are the factual people. They're not interested in like hearing the fluff. They're not interested in the sales pitch um, uh, or knowing like your product or your service. They just want to know the stats and they just want to know the hard concrete information. So no fluff and more numbers. So these kind of people are going to say um, stuff like, let's see, example, I understand your hesitation, but keep in mind that our APR is one of the lowest in the country at 23.99%. Uh, so that would be like a lender. So when you have somebody objecting, they're going to be interrupting you. They're going to have a lot quicker of a tone. Um, they're going to say, well, what's the numbers? What do the numbers look like? What is my home worth? And so you don't want to go into your whole sales pitch of, oh, well, I'd like to set up an appointment and come over and walk through and take pictures and go through the whole action. Like they don't want to hear all that. Great. I understand you want to know your numbers. I just need a few details from you so I can get that from you. Boom, boom, boom. Awesome. It's tomorrow or Wednesday at four o'clock. A better time to call you back with those numbers. So very direct, very straight to the point. And you'll recognize these people because they are also very direct and very straight to the point. Um, the friendly people are going to be people who are not interested in the stats. So they're going to be very different from the factuals. Um, even though the stats can help them, they're not really interested in it. Um, they're more interested in building the rapport and learning about the company, the ethics, the model, um, how good it's going to make them feel. Um, they're kind of a mix of uh, data, but also I kind of want to be your friend. So these people are going to, uh, they're going to want to know the numbers, but they're going to want to hear them quick. And then they're going to want to get into the fluff. So, well, what are you going to do to help my house sell? Oh, well, we're going to do an open house and we're going to door knock and we're going to have flyers and I'm going to do social media marketing. And those are the questions that they're going to be asking. Well, how are you going to help me? What is this going to do for my home? Um, how are you going to advertise my home? Um, who are you sending my home to? So they're going to be asking more of the um, logical questions but they're wanting to know the answers. Whereas the factual, they don't care. They just want the numbers. They don't care how you got the numbers. They just want to know the numbers. The friendly person wants to know how you're getting the numbers and wants to know the details of getting the numbers. Um, these people are going to typically talk to you a lot more in depth on the phone. So they're going to be quick and brash. Whereas a friend is going to be a little more thorough, a little more engaging on the phone. When you get those kinds of people, that's where you want to mention the numbers, but you don't want to be selling the numbers. You want to be selling your product. You want to be selling you as a service. And then the objector, um, this is more of a personality type where they're just going to object to everything that you say. Um, and the best way to conquer them is, um, I'm just going to read this right here. The best way to conquer this difficult customer, um, is by asking them what they think and basing your sales pitch on their individual concerns. So for example, I understand your hesitation. No one likes paying interest on a loan. However, remember you will only pay interest on what you use and never set more. So, hey, what is your biggest concern of my product? Well, I have to pay interest. I understand you have to pay interest. Everyone typically has to pay interest. But what's great about our product is you don't have to pay any more money over the interest amount that we quote you. Um, so that would be for like a lender type base. For real estate, you're going to get people who are going to object mainly to the price that you're giving them. So it's going to be, well, I think my house is worth 500, not 450. Why are you telling my house is worth more or less than what I think it is? Well, I can understand why you think your house is worth 500. 
Um, you're probably referencing to these comps that I have pulled up right here, A, B, and C. And I can totally see why you see that value. However, those homes were able to achieve that value because they had upgrades X, Y, and Z. Now, Mr. Joe, if your home also had those upgrades, then I could see why we could get your home to 500. However, your, your home does not have those upgrades. Would you be willing to put those upgrades in? So asking more for their opinion and then running the conversation off of those opinions. So ask for their issue and then solving their issue. And the thing with solving their issue is it may, me, it may not even be solving it the way that they want it solved, right? So they may have an issue with the price you gave them, but maybe solving their problem is not getting them the price. It's getting them the information for them to understand why their price can't be there. So their issue is the price, but to solve that pricing issue, we need to justify we, why we can't go to that price. Your objector is mainly going to be agents that you're calling with Bowen. So um, factual and friends, these are gonna be more like cold calls. These are gonna be off market lists, um, off market leads, traditional people that you're working with. Um, agents are gonna be your hardest one for objections. Well, I'm listed at 499, why are you sending an offer $100,000 less? Well, agent, have you run comps on this neighborhood? Yes, I have, and my price is justified. Awesome. Can you do me a favor and can you send me those comps that you are justifying your price with? Absolutely, I'll send you my comps. I get the comps and then I blatantly see, okay, these are not valid, these are unjustified, and then I give them a call back and I explain why we cannot use those comps and why their justification is not correct. So objectors usually need education. Friends don't want to be educated. They want to be kind of filled in on why you're educated on what their home would sell for. Factual, they don't want to be educated or told what to do. They just want to know their answers. So those are to be kind of your different groups um, of different people that you're going to be more than likely coming across um, in your cold calls. So, um, few different stats for you. These are very interesting. 69% um, of buyers have accepted phone calls from new um, phone numbers in the last year. So 69% of people are answering the phone from a basically an unknown number that they don't know. Um, the same survey, survey found that 57% of um, these buyers prefer to be contacted by phone rather than other methods. So nearly half of that group want to be called or texted. They don't want to be emailed. Um, they don't want to receive a letter. They want something done on the phone. Um, and then here's another fun fact. If you think it's easier to grab their attention with a snappy email, think again, the average business person receives 97 emails a day. So all of these agents, they're getting those drip campaigns. They're getting notifications. They're getting all of their regular traditional emails that are coming in nearly a hundred of those a day. So, and I know personally, when I get put on a drip campaign, I unsubscribe right away because I don't want that coming in. I don't need to know about it unless I want to know about it. Then I stay on it. But if I was involuntary, if I was, not volunteering to be on a drip campaign, I just unsubscribe right away. So calling is the most uncomfortable thing, but it's gonna be the most effective. Sending somebody an email is good for following up and getting them the information, but it's horrible for that first outbound attempt, um, even like your second, third, fourth, fifth outbound attempt to get a hold of them. Mailers too um, are not going to be the most successful. It's gonna be making calls. So um, with cold calling, um, I have 10 different tips um, of what to focus on for the day. 
And then I think after we're done with this, I'm going to get you out of here to get on the floor with Andrew. Okay, so 10 different tips. These are all things that I've kind of accumulated over the last few years. Um, things that I've like focused on and things that have just made the most um, sense for me um, to get my stats and um, to have better success rate when I'm calling. So first one is silly. It sounds silly, but um, it's very necessary. It's just setting a very clear goal for the day. So setting goal. And a lot of people don't even set their goal. They just say, oh, I'm just going to go in and just, you know, call this list and just dial for like two hours. And the problem is, is if you're sitting there for two hours and no one's answering the phone, you're irritated, right? You're not getting success. You're not hitting that goal that you're wanting to hit. So setting something that is realistic um, and something that is like, obtainable um a realistic goal and obtainable goal because what happens is if you don't hit your goal you feel discouraged for the next day but if you hit your goal you typically want to keep going so let's just say my goal for the first like six months in real estate is every day i sit down to do a focused cold call session my goal is one appointment or maybe my goal is to talk to 10 people Whatever it is, set something that is realistic. It's kind of like, um, have you heard the motto before? Uh, when you're making like your list of things to do for the day, your first task on your list should be make a list. Because when you go and cross off things on your list that you've done, if you make your list and your item one was make a list, you get to cross that off. And it feels good. It's like, okay, cool. I've already tackled one thing for the day. And then that all kind of sets your mindset of, okay, cool. I've tackled something. Let's get going. Even though it was just to make a list, you hit your goal of making a list. So um, something that is tangible, talking to 10 people in your session is very, very tangible, right? They all may tell you to screw off and never to call them again, but those are now 10 people that gave you your nose to now get to that one yes that you needed. Those were 10 people that got your jitters out. So your 11th phone call may be your best phone call that you do. So setting something that is um, obtainable. And then um, keeping in mind that when you're calling, you're not focused on the sale. So if you focus on getting a sale, you are probably not going to get a sale because you do what we call commission breath. <laughs> commission breath means you can literally hear it in somebody's voice when they are trying to make money. They're desperate, right? They're trying to make the sale. They're trying to get you to buy something. You can just hear it in their voice. If you're not focused on the sale and you're just focused on hitting your numbers, you're going to come off a lot more natural um, and a lot more easier to talk to per se. So if your goal was just to talk to 10 people, you're just going to talk to 10 people. Right. Now, if you got a sale out of that, that's amazing, but that wasn't my goal. My goal was to talk to 10 people. So keeping your focus off the sale and on your goal. And um, if you're too focused on the sale, you can come off too pushy or desperate. Instead, focus on what you want to accomplish by the end of the day. Um, maybe that's getting a referral. Maybe that's booking a meeting. Maybe that's just doing all your follow-up calls. Uh, maybe that's getting an appointment. But identifying that as your goal will make that a lot easier to avoid. And then um, second thing is developing a helping mindset. So what does your product do for customers? Um, what do you do for, what is your value? What is the value you're providing? Um, 
when can customers, uh, what can they accomplish with your product? How does it make them feel? How does it improve their daily life or their business? So for Bellwood, if you are calling a listing agent to just get an offer on the house, you're probably just going to get an offer on the house. But if you're coming from a helping mindset, you're maybe going to get an offer on the house, but now you're also going to be talking to this person about how this can improve their business. Hey, have you heard about Bellwood? Have you heard about the opportunities that you can have with working with Bellwood? Have you heard about the unlimited access to the iBuyer you get with Bellwood, the unlimited commission checks that you can earn, how you can turn a regular business into a thriving business, a six figure business, a seven figure business, depending on your location and your price point and your hustle. So coming to people again, you're going to want to know if they're the factual, the friend or the objector, but coming to them from a mindset of this is my product and this is why you need to know about my product because this is how it's going to help you in your business and your personal life. If you want to travel more or provide more for your kids or pay off debt or go back to school, whatever it is, well, my product can help you get there. And here's why. So more of a helping uh, mindset, being genuine and um, really not pushing your product if somebody's not asking questions. 96% um, of buyers agree that one of the biggest factors to influence their purchase de decision is when the provider focuses on the value they can deliver. So rather than selling the product, selling the vision, selling the value of what the product can do. And then we've already talked about this one before, time blocking. So again, we wanna make sure that when we're blocking out um, our day, that we're putting within our time block when we're doing new outbound and when we're following up. Because our follow-up can take more time than our new outbound. Um, it depends on the kind of people that you're following up with. They may be more of the friend that wants to talk, or they be, may be more of the person that just wants to know um, the numbers. Number four is body language. And a lot of people are like, body language? I'm on the phone. Why does it matter like what I'm doing with my body? It has everything to do with your body. So the three M's um, that I talk about uh, with body uh, language is music, movement, and mentality. Music, movement, and mentality. So um, when you think about it, uh, do you watch sports or have you ever played sports before? So every athlete kind of has their, um, uh, their setup, right? Uh, a pitcher. They go up there, they have, you know, their little rhythm that they have. If you're a swimmer, you kind of have your shaking and your jumping and your kind of movement that you have. Basketball players, they all have their thing. Volleyball players, they all have their thing before they start. So body language contributes the same way to when you're making a phone call. So all of these things factor in to your energy on that call. Music is a huge one for me. If I'm in a quiet room, you almost kind of start getting in your head a little bit more because there's not like a distraction or kind of like music kind of runs like the flow, the energy of a room. If you have loud, aggressive music on, you tend to get in a more aggressive mood. If you have classical, smooth jazz on, you're in a more smooth, kind of relaxed mood. So music, actually one of my favorite things that I like to put on, and people crack up when they hear it, but it works all the time for me, is I do instrumental beats. And so, what I like about instrumental beats, and you can literally like on any station, Spotify, Pandora, Alexa, whatever you use, I just say play instrumental beats. And what it does is it takes a lot of like hip, uh, hip hop, R&B, um, rock, rap, and it takes just the instrumental. 
So you're not hearing the words. So you're not getting distracted by words actually coming in, but the beats are keeping you in kind of like a nice groove. What I notice is whenever I have on an instrumental um, upbeat music, I usually tend to get into like a really good like focus. If I put on like classical or country, I still kind of am in a good mood, but it always kind of affects me into like a slower pace. Whereas a more upbeat pace is gonna put you into an upbeat mood. So I always have, um, and you can do non-instrumental, but sometimes when I'm calling, I can find the words being distracting. And sometimes your customer on the other phone can hear it too. And they're like, what are you listening to? <laughs> so I've had a few people kind of recognize in the background what I've been listening to if I don't have instrumental on. Um, and then movement. So a really good um, person uh, that talks about movement is, um, I'm blanking on his name right now. It is not Tom Ferry. Oh, what is his name? Oh, it's gonna drive me nuts. I'm brain farting right now. Um, I will come back to it. But basically what he does is he hosts these like two, three day long seminars. And at the end of a seminar, he does um, uh, like a fire walk. Like he'll literally have people walk over fire. Um, and he's all about mindset and um, like how much your mindset can affect uh, just your day-to-day -day activities, but more importantly, like your business. And so movement, in the middle of his seminar, he'll just like stop talking and be like, everyone stand up and do 50 jumping jacks, go. And everyone's like, what? And people will just start doing jumping jacks and then everyone's done doing jumping jacks and they're like, I feel good, I feel energized. You know, I feel, you know, ready to take on whatever this next conversation may be. Um, when you think about it, if you're sitting and you're just slumped over and your head's down, your energy is really low. But if you're standing and talking and moving around, um, I forget the phrase that people say, but energy, I think they say like energy flows where your attention goes. So if you're moving, you'll see a lot of speakers. They're always walking around. They use their hands a lot. They're usually, you know, very interactive, clapping, moving, walking, because if you're just stagnant, your energy is just stagnant. So with cold calling, I always tell people stand when you're calling, never sit because your energy comes down. Um, so if you're, um, standing and you don't have a desk that's like high enough for you to focus on um you can get adjustable desks you can also get like on amazon they're like a hundred bucks and you can put them on top of your desk that raise your laptops up and down so you can stand when you're making calls i always do bluetooth headsets with my phone and i'll just be kind of standing walking around my desk interacting sometimes i'll do squats or lunges just kind of moving because if you sit there, it's just so much longer. Um, and it just feels so much more like, nah, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, it's really going to bug me what that guy's name is. Um, let's see. Motivational speakers. And when I see it, I'm going to be like, ah, Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins. I knew it. So he is really cool. Um, I would check him out on YouTube. Um, Tony Robbins is very, very into movement and energy. Um, things like you eat and drink before like you go into like a sales meeting or a sales pitch, how those calories can even just affect like your brain like awareness. Um, he gets very into like the psychological part of things. And it sounds really like, okay, this is way too intense, but it makes sense. It really makes sense. When I used to cold call, everyone was drinking coffee and started by, yeah, I'm gonna drink some coffee, woo. And then I find out like the coffee was like overstimulating me and I would talk way too much. And so now when I present, or when I make phone calls, I don't drink coffee at all because I know my energy just from standing up is enough for me 
to get going. If I also drank coffee, I'd be standing here shaking and not even know what I'm talking about half the time because my brain is just so wired, but that's also my personality. Mm -hmm. There's some people that need coffee to talk or interact or whatever it may be. And then mentality. Um, so a lot of people talk about um, affirmations, um, verbal affirmations. These can sound really um, silly to do, um, but there's something about doing verbal affirmations um, in the morning, but also right before you call that is kind of like that self-talk, right? Um, when you're playing sports, your coach is always like, all right, team, you know, we got this, you know, they have their, their pep talk halftime. There's a pep talk. There's a, you know, a mode to that conversation. Your verbal affirmations is your coach. So a lot of people in the morning, they'll have their verbal affirmations written on their mirror, or they'll have something written down and you look at yourself, like you're talking to yourself and you say these things whatever it may be. I am, you know, strong. I'm beautiful. I'm courageous. I'm outgoing, whatever your affirmations are. And then cold calling, when you go into a session, you always want to do the same thing. Take a few minutes to get set up, get your music on, get your movement going. What a lot of people do, um, a lot of high producing, um, sales people that are just making a lot of money in sales, they'll be doing like a whole warm up routine before they call and people are like, what are you doing? Like you're in a suit and tie and you're making phone calls right now and you're jumping around doing lunges and squats and you're screaming, I am the best. And people are like, what is going on? Well, they're out there also crushing it, making seven figures a year, making phone calls, right? And it all comes from your movement and your mentality and how you're prepping yourself to make those phone calls. It sounds really silly, but I promise you, if you did one day without doing all of this, and then you did another day, even just implementing a few of these things, your mindset is going to be in a whole different world. Um, and then prepare to speak with gatekeepers. You will find these quite a bit with realtors. Gatekeepers are... Um, the secretaries, the assistants, um, the people who will not let you talk to the person that you want to talk to. So um, you don't ever want to give these people an out. So you're going to avoid the questions like, did I catch you at a bad time? Do you have five minutes to talk? Is this a good time to talk? Every single time they're going to say no. So you always want to come back with, oh, hey, glad I caught you. Can you get me on his schedule for tomorrow at four? Nope, he's not available tomorrow at four. Great. What times is he available between one and three on Thursday? What time works for him on Friday between 11 and five? So giving those, those choices to where they have to give you an answer and they can't say yes or no. Gatekeepers are going to be um, more for your realtors and less for your um, cold calls. Um, using those questions, um, did I catch you at a bad time? Do you have five minutes to talk? Will get you a 40% less chance of actually getting an appointment. So 40% of the time, if you ask that question, you will never get an appointment because like even our assistant here, when they ask, oh, can I speak with Bo? Can I speak with Megan? Can I speak with Amanda? Oh, they're not available. Can I take a message? That's our natural response. But if we had somebody that called in and said, hey, I'd like to set up an appointment. Are they available tomorrow at four? Oh, let me check on his schedule and I'll get back to you. So um, never ask those questions where they can just say no. Um, number six, using social proof to establish authority. To establish authority. So uh, real results speak more than any kind of sales pitch that you can do. Um, when you're talking to a prospect about your product, try to include a brief case study um, or like a customer success story. Again, it's going to depend on the type of customer that you're talking to. Um, those kind of social proofs are going to be um, more valuable in your cold call. 
it's a way of basically saying like, hey, don't just take my word for it. Like here's actual proof of what we've done. Um, and then you wanna make sure that you have like this case study prepared before you just try to go out there and wing it. So a good place to look is actually on our YouTube page. You can see investor testimonials. You can see realtor testimonials um, where agents have worked with Bellwood in the past and they made X amount of money where investors have invested with Bellwood in the past and they made X amount of a return. They did X amount of transactions. So the three things that you always want to provide though, um, when you're telling this story is the problem, the solution and the results. Problem, solution, results. So in this case, it would be, hey, we had a friend um, named, uh, we'll just go with Faraday. She's our realtor in Santa Barbara. We had a realtor friend, uh, Faraday. She was really tired of working traditional real estate. And so um, she was just feeling burnt out. Her clientele was really low. So that's our problem, right? And so she ended up finding out about Bellwood where she can utilize working with Bellwood any day, any price point. The thing that was hard about Santa Barbara is your price point is much higher than a traditional marketplace like Sacramento or even Los Angeles. But what she learned is as long as the numbers make sense, Bellwood will buy it. So Faraday started focusing on those higher end price points where she was only doing maybe five to six transactions a year, but she was making on average 70 to $80,000 on each transaction. So we told the problem, she was running out of clientele. She didn't have a lot of business coming in. The solution was she found Bellwood and realized that the price point that she works can actually accommodate them. And her results was still finding those properties and making a lot of money from it. Short little story, here's our proof. I can even send you her testimonial video if you would like. So now that's not just you saying, hey, I work for Bellwood and I do all these transactions and I make all this money. Okay, great, like that's just coming from you. You're gonna tell me what you want because you're the salesperson. Here is somebody else that has experienced this product. That's not me. Um, but again, we want to be conscious on the type of person that we're talking to. Sometimes they just want to know stats. Sometimes they want to be that friend that wants to know the fluff. Um, number seven is always be clear on your next steps with who you're talking to. This can be a traditional person. This can be an agent. This can be a friend, a family member. It doesn't matter who it is. You always want to be clear on what your next step is. So never end the call um, without knowing exactly when you're going to talk to this person again. And you're also going to introduce them to the next steps with a brief summary. So um, you want to show the prospect that you're listening to their concerns and that you understand their needs. Um, it also gives them the opportunity to add any important points that weren't discussed during that time where you can then handle that in a future call or you can handle it before the end of the call. Before hanging up, you wanna, even if you've said, okay, cool, um, does tomorrow at three or four work and they say three o'clock, great. Before you end the call, you wanna make sure that you remind them of the day and time and place if you're gonna meet them somewhere. And uh, you'll be contacting them or they should be contacting you in the form of contact that they'll be receiving. So whether that's an email, whether that's a phone call, um, a lot of times before I get off the phone with people, I always say, hey, before um, I get off the phone with you, I just wanna let you know what you can expect from me in our next step. Um, our next appointment to discuss uh, X, Y, and Z will be this Thursday at 3 p.m. I'll be giving you a call. I will also be sending you a calendar invite to put on your schedule so you're reminded of it. And I will also be sending you an email with everything that we discussed today and the future details of our next call as well. Feel free to respond to that email or write down any questions that you have between now and our phone call at 3 p.m. on Thursday. So I'm always very redundant with it. Um, and that comes from uh, practice and just habit of everything too. 
Um, let's flip this around. I'm running out of room. All right, number eight is learn from every objective. So um, every objective that you get is going to be different for every different kind of person and personality. Um, but even when you get a no from somebody, okay, great. Maybe you didn't get an offer out or you didn't make money on that phone call, but you learned some piece of value from them saying no. Maybe it was the way you answered the phone. Maybe it was the way you talked to them. Maybe it was the first question that you asked. That wasn't a normal first question that you asked. So every time you get a no, um, you always want to analyze what went wrong in that conversation. What could I have done differently? Because your no's are going to teach you a lot more than your yeses. Because a yes, you're doing everything right, right? Like you're saying the right things, you're doing the right things. Um, you know, your pitch is good. Everything is where it needs to be because you got a yes. But if you get a no, something's wrong. And what I tell a lot of people is when you're in real estate, the best thing you can do is fail, fail forward and fail quickly. So I learned so much from doing things wrong than I did from doing things right. Um, because you learn to never do it again. You know, like if I wrote a contract wrong and it got me sued, I guarantee you, I will never, ever, ever write that contract wrong ever again. Right. And I never have, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, but if I'm doing something right all the time, maybe to the situation it's right, but maybe I'm still writing that contract wrong, but no one's recognizing it. And then I get into such a habit of writing it that way that somebody catches it in like three to four years and they're like hey you've been writing this wrong and now i can sue you for it and it's like whoa hold on i've been doing this for like so many years and no one's ever said anything mm -hmm. well you know that's not my problem now i get to sue you so failing forward um and failing quickly best way to do this is just getting on the phones and making negotiations calling people in, in what we do with Bellwood, we can usually, unless you're in contract on something, if you're trying to get in contract on something and you say something wrong, we usually can backpedal and correct it or fix it. Um, it's really hard to say the wrong thing unless you are just not paying attention and you are just winging it you're making a phone call and you're like, oh yeah, we're cash buyer. Uh, we can close tomorrow and I'm going to give you 20% over asking price every single time. Hold on. That's not what we do. I can't fix that. Mm -hmm. Right. But maybe you quoted them 330 and we really need like 315. Well, we can fix that. That's a, that's an easy adjustment. Is that a fail in a negotiation? Yes. But is that you learning from why we need to go from 330 to 315. Yep. And so now before you ever offer a price again, you'll probably always double check before you give that price out. And that's the biggest thing that people have learned with Bellwood is they'll offer prices or they'll offer certain incentives. And then they'll come to us and be like, Hey, I got this lead. I got this offer that's going to go out. I told them X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, hold on. Why did you tell them that? Well, I just thought like that would work. And I'm like, yeah, that's not going to work. We can fix this conversation, but next time don't just offer a price say, Hey, let me review with my buyer before I get you a price and I'll get back to you and then come review with me. So if you get too intimidated by not knowing enough to say, and that's stopping you from making phone calls, you'll never make phone calls. You kind of just have to jump in um kind of see how the flow of things go because a script will guide you so much through the conversation but it's not going to give you the answer to every conversation right, right? there's going to be times where you're going to have to come up with something you're going to have to not follow your script um 
sometimes as soon as you start talking on the phone, your script doesn't even apply and you just kind of have to wing it. So really having the confidence and knowing enough information to get through the conversation. And the best thing that I tell people is, Hey, I'm really unsure on um, the answer to that. I don't want to get you the wrong answer. Let me speak with my manager and I'll give you a call back. Even if it's the most simple answer. Well, what title and escrow company do you need to use? Uh, I think it's this one place called Orange Coast, but I'm not sure. Let me get the correct answer for that. Let me talk to my manager and I'll give you a call back. So I always say that. And then um, number nine, establishing your follow-up. And this is establishing your follow-up for yourself. So um, making sure that in your CRM, you have the next follow-up date, you have all of your notes logged. Um, maybe this also includes sending your prospect an email with all the follow-up from the phone call. So making sure that you have a very consistent system of what you're going to do with your follow-up and then implementing that system after every single phone call that you do. So then it just becomes natural and a habit of doing it regardless of who you talk to and when you talk to them. And then, oh, these were the numbers I was looking for the other day. And then do your follow-up. This is the number one thing that I like scream at people, not literally, but um, if you're not doing your follow-up, everything else you're doing in your day is literally a waste of time, a complete waste of time. Um, and here's why. So this is interesting. I love these numbers. 48% um, of people never follow up after the first time they make a phone call. 48% of people never follow up after the first time they make a phone call. So if you make a second phone call, you're already basically 50% ahead of everyone else who is making that phone call. 25% of people stop attempting to reach somebody after the first phone call. So they'll call the first time and then 25% of them just won't even say, I'm going to try to call them a second time. So 48% of them don't do it, but 25% of them are assuming that they're just not even gonna do it at all. 12% of people only attempt to contact their lead three times. So if you are planning on calling this person, um, at least four times, you're already in like the top 10% of sales. 10% of people make more than three attempts. And then these are stats for your actual attempts. And these are really interesting. 2% of sales are closed on the first phone call or the first attempt, 2%. 3% of sales are closed on the second attempt. 5% of sales are closed on the third attempt. 10% of sales are closed on the fourth attempt. And almost 80% of all sales are closed on the fifth attempt. So you go from two, three, five, ten 10 to 80, 10 to 80% between one phone call. Yeah. And what's crazy is 10% of people are not even calling after the third phone call. So you're already in the top 10% of sales nationwide. And that this could be any form of sales. This could be selling a car. This could be selling magazines, real estate. This is a national sales um, statistic. If you call somebody more than three times, you're already in the top 10%. And if you call them on your fifth one, you have an 80% chance of closing them. So when you're building out your follow-up, I would just already assume I'm going to call these people probably eight times before I even close them. So again, going back to that number where you're not focused on the sale, you're focused on the goal. 
So if your goal consistently stays on just talking to X amount of people, well, if I talk to 10 people every single day and eventually those people get cycled through to seven, eight times, they're going to close statistically, right. right? So if I'm not focused on the close and I'm just focused on following up with them, statistically, I'm going to close on them. So that is my cold call.